O Lord, open our eyes to behold your presence. O Lord, open our ears to hear your voice. O Lord, open our hearts to receive your love. O Lord, help us to behold, to hear, and to receive you in word and sacrament, that our mouths may proclaim your praise. Amen. Please be seated. This poor man that Jesus is dealing with here with in Luke's gospel this morning is truly deeply afflicted. Now, I know y'all think that us Southerners have a high tolerance for eccentric folks, and we do. I've said before that we love our colorful people, and we don't hide them away. In fact, Abby, we bring them out on the front porch, don't we, when people come by visiting, don't we now? We're so proud of our colorful people, particularly if you are from Savannah, as I am. The more colorful, the better. Isn't Aunt Jewel a mess? She's enjoyed poor health her whole life. Now that's an actual family quote from my family just to give you a sense of the color in my own family. But we aren't talking about that same kind of thing here. This man was not just colorful. He was possessed in a deep and profound sort of way. This story of Jesus against the power of evil is recorded in three Gospels. Matthew tells the story a little less in detail than Luke, but Mark gives us even more. It's when you cross-reference all three of the stories that you get its full depth. It's interesting that the word demon is mentioned only a couple of times in all of the Old Testament, but quite a lot in the Gospels. The Jews believed in the existence of demons, so you'd think that they'd pop up more often in the stories of old. But why? Why did they appear so often in the New Testament? Well, the reason is simply that the coming of Jesus was the equivalent of a visitation of the kingdom of God. It stirred things up. Jesus said, just as much in Luke chapter 11, verse 20. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. In the presence of Jesus Christ, you see, we get a glimpse of the future kingdom of God. And we just heard in this gospel that when Jesus, when this man saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. It was tormenting, you see, for this demon to see Jesus. And in another story concerning demons, they asked why Jesus had appeared so early on earth, because the end of time has not yet come, they say. They were not supposed to be punished and banished yet. The gospel says they begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. It was strange to see demons believe in Jesus as the son of the most high God, but they don't want to change their behavior. Now let's look at the application part of the scripture lesson. What does it have to do with our lives? And what is this passage trying to tell us? Well, first, folks, we've got to trust Jesus for our problems that are big or small. And this is so hard to do because we think we can figure everything out by ourselves. Jesus asked this tormented man, what is your name? And his answer was legion. Well, legion was code because you see, in the Roman times, a legion of men 
in an army was 5,000 people. So in other words, this man is saying he is being tormented by 5,000 demons. Now that may be a bit of an exaggeration, but have you not sometimes felt as if you had 5,000 problems? We often say, I have so many problems, I can't handle them. I'm burning out. Have you ever said anything like that? Well, this man has so many problems that he's lost his shame. Can you imagine? He didn't wear any clothes. He's lost all sense of decent living. He's living in the tombs amongst the dead bodies. Problems come big and small. Among all the stories of Jesus' powers against the forces of evil, this is probably the biggest one. After all, it's a man with 5,000 demons that seems insurmountable, doesn't it? But if Jesus can handle this man's problems, the message is he can handle ours. Secondly, God claims Prom or makes promises that we can claim. It was fascinating to read about this dialogue between Jesus and this possessed man. The demons asked him not to send them back into the abyss. The reason was that their time hadn't come yet. They were having too much fun. It was as if God had made a covenant with the demon that he would not send him into the abyss until the kingdom of God had arrived. Now you remember this little detail. There's a hillside nearby with a large herd of swine feeding and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter the swine because they knew they had already lost the battle with Jesus. They were not going to get to stay in this man. Jesus would be sending them out. So he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the swine. But here's the twist. They rushed down a steep bank into the lake and were drowned. These problems were vanquished. Not in any way the man could have foreseen. The point is that if Jesus kept his prom promise to those lonely, lowly demons, he surely would keep, keep them for you and I. Did you know that there are about 6,000 promises made in the Bible? Yep, 6,000. Somebody took the time to count them all. Jesus' last words are in the form of a promise. Perhaps for me, the most comforting words found anywhere in the Bible. I will be with you till the end of the age. What a great and comforting promise that is. Folks, Jesus is the original promise keeper. And you can claim all of those problems and live in a secure life knowing that Jesus will fulfill them. And I don't want you to be afraid. The people in the Gospel Stories community were worried after seeing and hearing the power of Jesus. It freaked them out. This man, for years, had been such a problem in this community. They could not even keep him shackled. And all of a sudden, someone comes in and cures him. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how Jesus had taken the demons from this possessed man. Then all the people in the surrounding country asked Jesus to leave them. Now that's a surprise, isn't it? You would think that they would have rallied around Jesus and begged him to stay, but instead they were seized with great fear. So he got into a boat and he did what they asked. He left. Don't be afraid like these people were. The second letter of Timothy 
says, for God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Whenever we have that spirit of fear, when, when we feel it welling up inside of us, we need to examine ourselves and remember what Paul, uh, what Timothy said in that letter. The formerly possessed man was sitting in front of Jesus, obviously in comfort and relief, dressed and in his right mind. But the rest of the crowd couldn't handle it. They had to ask Jesus to leave. The unclean spirit is the spirit of fear, really, folks. And they were afraid of Christ's presence. The presence of Jesus means to some people a change for their future. And that is so frightening for all of us to really embrace Jesus. And Jesus' message and his call to us calls change into our life. So recognize that power, that power that Jesus has, and don't be afraid of what he's calling you to do. And my final point is one you've heard many times from me. Tell others what God has done for you. You might ask why Jesus sent this man to witness to others what God had done for him. But in most other occasions, Jesus wanted those whom he had healed to keep quiet. Remember these stories when he would say, tell no one what has been done for you? Well, it's a simple fact. It was because these people were not Jews. This was a Gentile town. The presence of the swine herd tells us that because swine would never have been allowed in a Jewish village because they were so unclean to the Jews. And Jesus performed miracles, many miracles among the Jews, because he knew it wasn't time for everyone to know who he was in that community. But in this Gentile town, it was not harmful for them to witness for him. Yes, I said the word witness. So he sent them out to tell what Jesus had done for him. But the man, he begged Jesus that he might follow him and be with him. But Jesus said no. He knew that there was a stronger message that this man could do for his community. And he says, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So the man did as he was told. He went home proclaiming to everyone who would listen just what God had done for him. Evangelism is telling people what God has done for you. Evangelism has such negative connotations, doesn't it? I've used the example so many times before of the person standing out on a soapbox on the corner, waving their Bible and shouting out loud. It conjures up such negative imagery or someone trying to force their brand of religion down your throat, telling you your brand isn't the right one. I received a long discourse in a text Thursday morning from someone telling me just that based on my Facebook post this week about the murders in Orlando, that my brand of Christianity was inauthentic and not right. But that's not what evangelism is all about. The word evangelism came from the same root word as angel, which means the carrier of good news. So if you have a little good news to share, you're evangelizing. If you say that I have a great church, I'd love for you to come with me sometime. That's evangelizing. Or if you say, I prayed and got through this, that's evangelizing. I know that some of us came to church this morning with so many problems at work or at home that they might seem overwhelming 
at times. But the story today from the gospel reminds us to give those problems to Jesus. And like the man completely absorbed by his demons, Jesus can handle them, each and every one. Don't be afraid of what answer Jesus gives you. He knows what's best in our lives. And when you experience that healing, whatever it be, don't be fearful to share it with all that you know. May God bless us all as we share his good news. Amen.